What's it called? You know what? I can't find it. I don't want to take any more time. We're just going to get started. Is that cool, guys? Everybody ready? Yeah. yeah. I thought we already started. No, they unofficially we did, but yeah. So I'm already well. drinking, man. I don't, I don't care. I'm already starting. Well, we'll go ahead and start. <laughs> we want to welcome everybody to Speaking Easy Live. Uh, this isn't an official like audio episode, but it's definitely an official YouTube episode. This is what, Will, probably the fourth one we've done? Something like that. We're experimenting. Yeah, but we've never done it this way where we have, where you can see everyone. It's really cool. Um, so welcome everybody to the podcast. It's brought to you by Rooted Distributing. Uh, hit their website, rootedky.com. Use the coupon code Tuck and Will, and uh, you can get 15% off any order over $20. You got to get that. Just, hey, using CBD, go hit uh, rootedky.com. All right. We have some special guests in the building. Uh, or on the computer screen, uh, joining us from their homes. We have um, I, my favorite photographer, easily to say, uh, definitely a um, on his way to being a legendary director. <laughs> that's my opinion. I know it's I know it's a big. I know it's a lot. Uh, I think it's a worldwide opinion to this point. Yeah, oh, he's well on his way. Uh, Antonio Pantoja, thank you for joining us. I'm sure I left out about seven different things that you actually do as far as yeah. titles and all that, but you know what I mean. It's a modern well, thank, you. thank you. I think you're giving me way too much credit, more credit than I deserve. So thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. And then um, probably probably his fourth appearance, I think, Will. I don't know. Both of them, actually, fourth. Yeah. Both of our guys, actually, their fourth appearance. They've been on more than anyone. And we appreciate it so much. So anyway, uh, without further ado, we got the big homie from way back. Will, how long have we known him? Twenty years. So, so long. <laughs> so many, so many different uh, portions of our life. Yeah, I know Man. that I had to have known him for twenty years at least. Yeah. Um. So, so one day he decided he was going to uh, move out, or not move out to LA. I think you did. I, I remember you did some theater and all that stuff in uh, Utah. Was it Utah? Yeah, Utah, South oh, Carolina. Yeah, yeah. He's been everywhere doing theater. Then he said, "You know what? I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna yeah, stop I'm gonna do theater. It. I'm gonna move to LA and become an actor." And you know what? My man is out there working. Uh, Daniel R. Hill, thank you, man. Thank you for showing up and being on our live at short notice too. I think we just asked you yesterday. Hey, what else I'm gonna do but try to find toilet paper? You know what I'm saying? Right? <laughs> Pandemic <laughs> problem. Yeah, man. So, um. Yeah, dude. Thank both of you guys for joining us. All right, let's get into it. So, uh, Daniel, I actually want to start with you. Um, you're you're out in California right now. Look at that sun behind me, y'all. Yeah, hey, yeah, man. Eighty two cool. here today. Eighty two. Yeah, man. What was it here? Like fifty and windy. It was terrible. <laughs> Maybe. Anyway, hold up. Y'all got you, Will? You got a drink? You might got a drink. I got you. Cheers. We gotta do the the cheers real quick. Boom, boom, boom. Thank you, guys. Um, what hit? There you go. Hit that water. That's God's. That's God's moonshine right there. That is. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, man. So, being out in California, am I right when I say that California was one of the first states to like lock lock everything down? Yeah, man. I, I, it was. It was back in like the first week in March, right in the middle of pilot season. Uh, which, you know, as I know you guys know, because we've talked about it on the podcast before, yeah. and I know as Antonio is well aware, that's the big time of year uh, where people are casting for um, not only brand new TV shows that are coming out, but uh, all the new films that are about to be shot that summer. And really as an actor, especially people like me, who that's your full-time job, if you don't get anything booked by basically Derby, like right at the beginning of May, then it's the barren desert, May, June, and July. And so May, June, and July, it's a drought. And then the auditions really start kicking back in for fall sweeps uh, and mid-season pickups and those things in August. Uh, now, over the years with you know the, the evolution of Netflix and Amazon and all these streaming services, uh, there's been more and more uh, year-round work, but the, the summer's typically always been drought season. So 
it's been interesting here because we started hearing rumblings of it in like the first week in March and like like March 1st that like, yo, be prepared for like pilot season, be put on hold and be smart with your money and on all these things. And I remember I was still going to the gym at, uh, at the LA Fitness here and right across from my gym is Costco. And so I usually buy like pretty much all, anything protein wise for Costco, steak, chicken, uh, protein bars, everything. And like one day I was just, I was like, man, let me run over here real quick. I, I need to get uh, some more steak and I'm gonna grab some TP while I'm here just because, you know, I, I was, you know, kind of, I think I had like maybe four rolls or something left. And so me and my friend rode across the street after working out and we got in there and it was a madhouse. And I was like, what, what is going on? And there wasn't nothing in the news yet. And we walked straight to the back of Costco, right where the eggs and everything are, and right to the right of the eggs. There's usually a mountain of toilet paper and paper towels. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? All about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And like, we walked to the back, and that section was empty. Yeah. No paper towels, no toilet paper, no bottled water. And I don't ever buy bottled water, but. I looked at the guy and I was like, yo, where, where's all the toilet paper? Like, and he was like, oh, it's in Pacific holding. Like, I was like, when are you getting it back? He was like, tomorrow. He's like, we get a shipment every day. So I was like, all right, I'll come back in a couple of days. So I got my other stuff, went and checked out. It was easy peasy. And then like, I think like two days later, it was like when the first big announcement came out on TV. And so like that day at the gym, I was like, oh, I, I better try again. So we try again. and it was even bigger of a madhouse so much so that they was out again. And the guy said people were lining up at 8 a.m. to get inside the store at 9 a.m. And then, so I waited a couple more days and I tried to go back a third time and I went at like 10 a.m. I was like, you know what? I'll get there at 10. I'll beat the 9 a.m. rush. Whatever they have is what they have. And I'm telling you, there was probably, and I did Instagram uh, videos of this. There was probably like 250 people waiting in line to get in the store. Holy shit. And by the time you got in, there was no toilet paper, no paper towels, no wipes, no sanitizer. You were, you were allowed to buy one thing of eggs per cart. Mm -hmm. You were allowed to buy, um, you know, like one thing of almond milk per cart. But by the time you went around and got, you know, whatever you could get, the line for checkout was all the way back to the eggs. Jeez. And the line went, the line went the length of the store. And then when we hit the clothes, the line zigzagged between the motherfucking clothes. It <laughs> took me 49 minutes to check out. Damn. Yeah. So like That's frozen just to food get the minimal small. shit. <laughs> Yeah, man. So it, it's been crazy since then. The industry shut down. Uh, you know, all the agencies and casting directors are like, we're not coming in. And even at the beginning, they were still like, we're just going to work remote. And then like pretty much right in the middle of March, they was like, we're done. Um, everything's put on hold because they knew all the precautions that were coming out. So right now, um, you know, for people who... Uh, <clears throat> have been out and blowing their money. It, it's got to be hard times. Now I'm looking at all my friends like Eddie Murphy and coming to America and going, aha, aha. <laughs> everybody always gives me, a, everybody always gives me a hard time because I don't ever want to go out and party. I don't ever want to spend no money because you never know when shit happens. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And, and also you got to think somebody like me, who's a full-time actor, like that's my only job. There ain't nobody else, even if I wanted or needed to get a job right now, ain't nobody hiring. Yeah. <laughs> people people firing people. How am I how am I get a job job right now? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh it's definitely gonna be difficult. I, I've been lucky that my reps have been using the downtime to still get me auditions and uh and still get me seen also by casting directors who hadn't seen me before. That's a big thing right now. But everything's on hold. We don't know when it's gonna start back up. It's looking like like maybe June. Um, I personally believe, you know, they they've extended the social distancing and, and all these rules to May 15th. I personally believe they actually have in mind 
like June 30th, but they don't want to tell everybody June 30th yet because they don't want to piss nobody off. Yeah. So I, I think like June 30th is when everything's going to go back to normal yeah. and people are going to party like a motherfucker for July 4th. Bro. Hopefully. That's a good point. Uh, um, Antonio, I wanted to get, I wanted to talk to you about something. <clears throat> a situation that I believe you found yourself in is when, oh, yeah. <laughs> when this stuff was all going down, when it all started handing down, when cruise ships were getting stranded, uh, when shit was going down, you were on a cruise. What? Yes. Yeah. So uh, the CDC said basically like uh, the day that we were going on the cruise. Um, well, I'll give you the, the this part of the story first. Um, Dusty was going on a cruise and uh, he's, he's with a new label and stuff like that. And um, the, the, basically this cruise was all of the labels fans. And then like a few other people were going to be on board the cruise. It was like Royal Caribbean. They were going to pretty much take it over. So, um, so it was going to be like all dirt rock, the, the label. And they wanted to talk to me about potentially doing some movie work in the future, investing in a movie or something like that. And Dusty was like, well, man, while we're on the cruise ship, we should shoot a music video because what other better way to shoot a music video would be on a cruise ship? And I'm like, that's excellent. So I go on the cruise ship and uh, the day that we did, all of the other cruise ships were ported and they wouldn't let them leave. Um, they were just kind of like sitting for days on, on the port. And then um, ours was able to leave, but they had 2000 cancellations. So it was pretty much just like the, the fans of the label that was on the entire cruise ship. And then when we finally got out to sea, the day that we went out to sea, the CDC said no cruise ships or whatever. So we were kind of all spooked and we all just heard what was going on, you know, just all hearsay and stuff that was on Facebook and stuff like that. So we finally made it to Mexico and they said that Trump shut down all the ports and you're going to be stuck in Mexico. And we were scared. We were concerned. Everybody on the cruise ship was concerned that if we get ported overnight in Mexico, that like the cartel was going to like flood the boat, you know, and uh, take everybody's stuff. So it was super scary. Um, that didn't end up happening. We were super lucky and we were able to come back home. And uh, since nobody on the cruise ship had coronavirus, we were like <laughs> maybe in one of the safest places in the world. But it was like me and Buckshot, and Crucifix and Dusty and just a bunch of really Matt trees, a bunch of really, really great guys. And um, it was a really, really cool, cool time and stuff like that. But uh, but yeah, man, it was like extremely scary at that time because we only knew, you know, like what people were saying. And at the time, like the day we left, like NCAA shut down, the MLB was like the next day. We were like, this is serious, you know. Yeah. So we didn't expect any of that stuff at all. And uh, yeah, we were we were out at sea during all that. Damn. So <laughs> so um were you were you guys scared of actually getting the virus or just scared at what was going on like with I think both man yeah like so um we were all like super careful like on the ship you know like there wasn't like a ton of social gathering to be honest with you because everybody was pretty spooked so the only time that we really did that was when like um the artists would perform because the artists like had to perform for the fans on the ship just like you know like a cruise ship has shows and stuff mm -hmm. like sometimes they'll do like a grease like a grease mock-up performance like a reenactment of the broadway show grease or stuff. but instead of that it was this band uh you know this several bands from this label they would do like performances or whatever so um that's pretty much like the only time that people would congregate because people were still pretty concerned and nervous you know that and there were still people who were like, oh, it's propaganda and it's just fodder from, you know, the media and stuff like that. Still, really early on, people thought it was just like fake, you know. Yeah. But um, but then once we like weren't we we were we made it to Mexico and we found out that we might not be able to leave the port. We might have to stay at Mexico overnight. That's when people started freaking out. Yeah, I guarantee it. Because <laughs> yeah, uh, even people were texting me and saying, get off the ship and then just fly home. Because uh, like you're gonna if you're gonna be stuck there you're gonna be in a bad situation. Yeah, man, you was in an episode of Better Call Saul. <laughs> That's right. Or the location scouts for uh, Narcos. I heard they went down to Mexico just like location scouting for the Netflix show Narcos, and like they ki like the cartel killed all the location scouts for real. Yeah, man. Like, yeah, they got murked. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. I did not hear that. Wait, so yeah, that, man, all the all of the Narcos location scouts were actually killed by the. Yeah. yeah, the cartel last year. Cartel? Yep. Yeah. They was down there. They was down there literally looking for locations to shoot and getting permits and stuff. And they saw the wrong thing and 
<laughs> wrong man. place, wrong time, man. They got Merck for real. Yeah. yeah. What do you got? Yeah. Narcos location scout shot to death in Mexico. Local media reports. Carlos Munoz portal. A location scout for a Nexusco narco was found shot to death while looking for locations for the show in Mexico, according to the local media reports. Holy shit. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. That's so, yeah, so location. Yeah, a lot of us knew about that, and that was, we were already concerned. You know, we've all seen Hell stuff yeah. on TV. So, <laughs> uh, having a port overnight, you're just completely defenseless because, I mean, what kind of security does a cruise ship have, really? Okay. You know, nothing. Right? Yeah. Yeah, they could run on that boat easily. Like Vikings, <laughs> yeah. you know? <laughs> Two dudes wow. with fucking AKs can take that whole boat. Yeah. He uh, worked on a lot of good films, too. The guy that got killed? Yeah. What do you yeah, do real bro. quick? Talk uh, to Man on Fire, uh, Mel G- Gibson's Apocalypto, um, the fourth film of the Fast and Furious franchise. Wow. That's right, crazy. Just, trying, just trying to do his job and make his money. He they did he didn't even have a Rona fighting chance. He just <laughs> straight up he just got murked. That's yeah, awful, man. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. Um, so uh Daniel, back to you real quick. Uh yeah. You were saying you were saying that you were thinking LA was gonna open up. What your gut feeling was like, what'd you say, June first? Is that what you said? I think it'll probably be like June thirtieth. Okay. Well, you know, you know what I just read literally like 30 minutes before we started, I was just kind of scanning the news to see if there's anything else I wanted to talk about. And um, I read an art or I read a headline and then I kind of breezed over the article of, I believe the mayor of LA or the governor of LA, I mean, governor of California uh, or the mayor of LA said that he doesn't think there'll be any sporting events or concerts in Los Angeles until next year like yeah it's a 2021 2021 that's what i heard yeah does that sound what do you think about that i mean i think it's very possible i mean the crazy thing is is like right now in inglewood there's a big uh resurgence happening so you know they're building the new stadium uh that's going to be a joint venture for both the rams and the chargers which don't even get me started. We can, we can go 20 minutes on how I'm heated that Brady didn't come to the Chargers and hold the fucking here. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, I was, I'm, a, I'm a Patriots fan, so I was like, all right, I could become a Chargers fan. I could do that. Um, yeah. But the Bucks, uh, I don't know. I'm just scratching my head over that one. But uh, so they're, they're building this brand new stadium in Inglewood. And of course, with that, is bringing in all this new business and this revitalization and all these new housing is going up. Uh, and then the owner of the Clippers has been wanting to build the Clippers a stadium in Inglewood near that stadium, but he couldn't uh, due to like encroachment laws. So this dude pulled one of the most baller moves of all time, and he bought the Great Western Forum in Inglewood, which used to be a, a basketball venue, but now is just for concerts. So he couldn't build a new stadium there because the Great Western Forum was there. So he bought the Great Western Forum and he's just going to keep it in a music venue. And now he's going to build the Clippers new stadium in Inglewood. Oh, um, so, you got, so you got all this brand new construction and revitalization of, of the wood happening. And, and now you got to think, I mean, a place like LA is already very daunting to move to anyway because it's so expensive. I mean... The, the rent here, e- even for, even if you're in like just an I neighborhood where you're probably going to hear gunshots a couple times a week, yeah. it's like two, like two bedrooms, like 1800 in a, yeah. like in an I neighborhood. So I think, uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens to the city. I mean, one of the things is one of my big fears is that if, if there isn't some sort of government mandate that comes across to give um, a financial freeze on uh, mortgages to where people who rent places uh, don't have to pay rent because their owners don't have to pay a mortgage for a certain time. You know, if they could give the owners of these condo and apartment buildings, uh, you know, a three month freeze or so, 
I worry that if that don't happen, our homeless population, which is already insurmountable, is going to be even more overthrown uh, and flooded because um, people are losing jobs. And I think part, and, and I do think part of the stimulus that has come across, you know, somebody that qualifies for unemployment right now also gets an extra $600 a week for the next 13 weeks all the way up until July 31st. So some people who were only making maybe $500 a week in California, the most you can qualify is 400 a week. So some people are getting like $1,000 a week for the next 13 weeks. So I think that's how they're trying to sort of offset these things. Um, but the craziness is a lot of that, a lot of that construction and all these new hopes for the city, I think are going to have to be halted to a degree. Uh, we also have the Olympics coming, uh, you know, in, in a matter of years and the city um, just a couple years ago when they got the Olympics, the city had to pledge something. I, I wanted to say it was like $800 million to public transit because LA's public transit is garbage. Um, there just isn't enough of it. The, the public transit that there is, the, the train system, when you can find it is actually really clean and really effective, but it's hard to get to a train station. It's not in abundance like it is in Chicago, New York, or DC. Um, so, you know, if here's the thing, they're saying we're not gonna have a damn vaccine for a year. Yeah. So if you're talking about not having a vaccine until March of 2021, then I don't know that you can put 70,000 people in a stadium root for people to play football. You know what I'm saying? And it'll be interesting to see if the NFL, you know, postpones games or if they play games without fans. That's yeah. what intrigued me the most about March Madness this year. This is why I'm kind of sad they canceled it. But I understand. I understand they had to. But the reason I wanted to see it is because I felt like when they talked about playing it with no fans, I was like, oh, that's going to help like the 13 and 14 seeds because they don't never play in front of anybody. Yeah. These teams like Duke and Kentucky and Louisville and North Carolina, they thrive on 20,000 fans screaming and cheering for them. Yeah. Monmouth and, yeah. you know, St. Mary's and all these small schools, you know, East Idaho Tech and shit like yeah. these schools play in front of like 900 people sometimes I was yeah. like I thought like man I want to see this tournament with no fans and I thought like a 13 seed could win it all yeah but um but you know without a vaccine I mean I really don't know how you can put 70,000 people you look at even college football the big house in, in Michigan and Ohio State stadiums hold over 100,000 fans. Yeah. And those places, they sell out every game. Oh, yeah. they, they, don't, they don't care who they playing. They could be playing Toledo a and They're selling out. <laughs> so yeah. um, I don't know, man. I, I think it's very possible that, uh, number one, I think we're all in for a rude awakening of what the new norm is, at least for a couple of years. I think people going forward um, from everything to going to the grocery store, uh, going out in public to concerts, I think a lot of social distancing is going to be in people's minds for a long time and rightfully so. I know, I know me, like when the gym opens back up, I'm, I'm going to be like bringing my own sanitizer wipes and everything just in case, you know, they aren't on hand or they run out or, you know, I feel like uh, I think we're all in for a lot of changes. Absolutely. And hope, and hopefully, they get a vaccine soon. That that's why I was I was really disappointed to learn. I think the thing that I've been most disappointed to learn through all of this is when the current president ended and disbanded the infectious disease and pandemic task force in 2018. And he and this is a factual thing. He did it in an interview. And he said that we didn't need to spend the money there on them at this time, that if we ever needed to get them back, that it would be easy and we could have them back quickly. And it's a real shame that that happened uh, because when you need a pandemic task force is all the time. 
so yeah. that they can stay ahead of this. Yeah. It's called being proactive and not reactive. Yeah, preventative. And so hopefully our country as a whole and, and the people in Washington learn from that and we never disband that task force ever again. Yeah, I don't think we will. I think, you know, you learn your lesson on something like this. I wanted to, Absolutely. I kind of wanted to use that as a, um, a segue over to Antonio. Antonio, um, and I want you to answer this too, Daniel, because this relates to both of you, but I want to I ask Antonio first. Um, how do you think that, I guess this is a, there's a couple questions within this. I read an article, uh, kind of the same as I did the article earlier. Saw the headline, gazed over it. It seemed to be like in, there was some truth to it. Um, AMC, isn't that what the big mm. theater company is? American yeah. movie company, I guess it, it's a theater company. Is there an actual need for movie theaters anymore? And... Are movie theaters a thing that is? You remember when? You remember when uh, Netflix came out and and uh, it killed Blockbuster. Well, yeah. now I feel like the whole digital, the whole streaming, all these streaming services are swinging their axes, whether intentionally or unknowingly, at theaters. Because I agree. You know, I love the idea of going to a movie, but I'm going to be 100% honest with you. The last time I actually got in my car and drove to the movie theater has been years. It, years. So I'm wondering, actually, do you think personally that it's killing, that, that, that after all of this, is there a need for us to go back into theaters versus just consuming it the way people probably, I would say, overwhelmingly consume it nowadays? Oh. At home on their screens, yeah. on their computers. What, what do you think about like box office numbers whenever um, they, uh, they, they, like we watched that film, uh, I think it's called Onward. It's like a Disney or Pixar film with the kids the other day. And it was 20 bucks to rent it at home. And, uh, and they still projected, or they, they posted their, um, their box office numbers, like their opening weekend numbers. And it was still like, I don't know, like $56 million. I don't know. That, that's an arbitrary number, but there was like, it was still a pretty like high number for what the movie is and what they expected from it. Uh, and that's, I guess, because people were still paying $20 from their home uh, versus paying like maybe it's $8 or $10 for a ticket now. I don't know. But um, so it still did, it performed pretty well. So maybe this is just an experimental stage to see how well they will perform without brick and mortar stores at this point. But um, I mean, I love going to the movie theater, but yeah. um but yeah, I mean, I, I we had like the um, what's that movie pass thing they had like a while back where you pay like ten dollars a month, I think it was, and watch unlimited films in the movie theater, and like we used it literally one time and we paid for it till they went bankrupt. So <laughs> yeah. So did AMC go bankrupt? I think they're going to. I think they're going to. They may have already, but uh, but we read that also that AMC is gonna go under. Man, that's yeah. A there's there's that there's that meme out there that says. Y'all charge $56 for a small popcorn. You ain't saved no money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. And, and that's another thing, you know, like it's, I, I don't know. I just feel like, I feel like what we're going through right now is almost accelerating the path we were already on as far as. Yeah. Did, it's the, def look how we're yeah, talking right now. You know what I'm right. saying? It's definitely going to change things, but. I do think a lot of movie theaters will go under. I think you'll see less movie theaters. Right down the street from me uh, in Burbank, there's three AMC theaters within 1.3 miles of each other. Wow. That's and so two of those will shut down. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think we'll see less of those. And one thing I think to consider too is this. I don't think it'll ever go away completely. No. For the same reason that why do you go to a Red Hot Chili Peppers concert if you own the CD? Because there's just a different experience. You know, yeah. why, why, you yeah. know why, do you, why do you go see, uh, you know, A Christmas Carol at Actors Theater of Louisville yeah. whenever, you know, you could just watch the movie version? It's a shared experience with people in a live setting. Yeah. Um, and, and the movie theater, like, I'm no, I'm not a, I'm not a big sci-fi or like Star Wars guy at all, 
years ago in my 30s is the first time I'd ever seen a Star Wars. And I did Same. so because I was like, well, shit, I might want to get an audition for one of these. So I need to know what they are. Um, and so I did go see the most recent one in theaters. And it was a different experience having people in the you know audience with you gasping and making yeah. noises. Be Hearing tough, people yeah. cry when people die and shit. Um, <laughs> so I don't think it's ever going away. <laughs> But I do think we're going to see more streaming services. I mean, I I had auditions last year a lot. I had a lot of auditions last year for Quibi, which is CBS's new streaming thing. And if you guys don't know, or if you might listen, it doesn't know what this is. Quibi is this brand new um, streaming service by CBS where they're putting out all original content, all brand new series but each episode of the series is 10 minutes long. And so the commercials they're running for them, especially out here in Hollywood is like, they'll show a, a famous person go up uh, to someone at a restaurant and say, you know, I need a table for two. And they'll be like, uh, yeah, it'll be about 10 minutes. Just wait a second, sir. And then they get on their phone and pull up Quibi and like watch an episode in the 10 minutes that they're waiting for their table. So I do think, and I, and who knows if that'll be successful. Uh, kudos for to CBS for trying something new. Um, yeah. But I, I do think, and, I, and one thing I think is going to happen is, and I, I predict this will happen by 2022, if not sooner. I think you're going to see three tiers of Netflix. So right now, Netflix is $12.99, and we all know what comes on Netflix. I think what will happen is because Netflix, I don't know if you know this, since 2012, they haven't turned a profit a single quarter. They've yeah. been in the red every yeah. quarter since 2012. So they haven't had a quarter in the black. Eventually you have to make a profit. You can't yeah. keep paying, you can't keep paying Dave Chappelle $60 million for three hours of content. That just <laughs> isn't sustainable. So what what will eventually happen, I think, is you, you gain a ton of money. Everybody knows this in any, any business through commercials. And I think eventually what will happen, because Netflix has made an announcement that they want by 2025 to be all original content. I think what will happen is by 2025, you'll see for $9.99 a month, $10, I think you'll have one tier of Netflix that'll be all original content with commercials. And I think if you want to pay $12.99 a month, it'll be all original content without commercials. And I think if you want to pay $15.99 a month, it'll be all original content plus Everything movies else. and shows that they're leasing, right? Mm -hmm. Like The Office and stuff like that for $15.99, no commercials. I think that's what we're about to see in streaming services is tiers of streaming yeah. if you're cool if you're cool with just having stranger things and ozark and a couple of other and it is ozark for everybody out there watching not ozarks no not an s right? it's ozark <laughs> um but, but I, I think you're going to see tiers of streaming so yeah. i think like quibi is a new thing they're going to test you know youtube now has their own like premium thing um which you know i i can't I can't bite on something that only has, I can't pay $8 a month for something that only has like one thing I'm interested in. Like the only thing I would watch is Cobra Kai and I would cancel it probably after two days. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I, but I think you're gonna start seeing the streaming services try new forms and tiers. Uh, that, that would be my guess of where it's going next. And if Quibi is successful, then you best believe you're gonna see, um, you know, uh, Apple TV Plus and and Prime and all these pay people, if, if if a ten minute streaming service is successful somehow, somebody will come out with a five minute episode streaming service. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's seven minute ads, man. I was I was about to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to say the same thing. Uh, uh, Daniel, real quick, uh, huge fan by the way. Uh, love the movie Rust Creek. Uh, when Tuck told me today, he was all like, check out this dude that's going to be on the podcast. And he showed me a picture. And I was like, I know this dude from somewhere. <laughs> and uh, he showed me the movie. And I was like, dude, I was like, ah, yeah, I was like, that's an awesome movie, by the way. But I have to ask you one question. 
Yeah. How was it when you got that phone call and uh, your agent was all like, hey, how, you're going to do a sex scene with Amelia Clark. Like, what was going through <laughs> your mind at that time? Like, I'm about to see Khaleesi and be, like, up close. And, like, I mean, like, I just can't imagine that, man. Like, I cannot imagine. <laughs> well, first off, thanks for the shout-out for Russ Creek. We're, we're really proud of that film. It, uh, I think when I, when I was on with Tuck and Will back in um, December, uh, we had just been announced as Forbes magazine, so one of the top 20 films of 2019. Uh, Showtime just picked us up for another year, so uh, we're streaming on Showtime. Uh, we're in rotation there, and you can also watch Showtime on demand. Um, and uh, we did we did a April Fool's joke this year. The producer of Russ Creek hit me up, and he said, "How would you like to be a part of an April Fool's joke?" And I was like, "I'm bored as fuck. What, what you got? What you know? What's on your mind?" <laughs> And uh, so they wrote up like this big article for Rust Creek 2 Bucks Revenge or something like that. And they had me like come back from the death as like a cyborg and all this stuff. Oh, yeah. And uh, so many people on Facebook who didn't actually like click and read the thing were like, oh man, congrats. They had the keys to the <laughs> franchise, you know. Um, but you know, those people were great. I still have a great relationship with them. I I'm willing to bet I'll probably work with those producers again. And I'm sure Antonio knows Stu Pollard and those guys. Yeah, yeah, um, and, absolutely. And they, and they now have offices both in Louisville and in L.A. Um, but as far as the Amelia thing, man, uh, what was crazy was I had auditioned for uh, Philip Noyce, the director. I had auditioned for three. They had had me audition for three other characters first. And read, so, oh yeah. I'll yeah, I auditioned for three characters, and then they called me back for two of the characters, and then I get to the callbacks, and then uh, and then after the callbacks, they had a director session in person with Philip, and when I when I came with both pieces, he was like, "Didn't I have you do a third one too?" I was like, "Yeah, but you only called me back for two. And he was like, "Do you have the third one ready?" And I was like, "You bet your ass I do." <laughs> so uh, I did all three all three characters uh, for him. And uh, like one, one was uh, one of the detectives. Um, one of them was a guy that like runs this like, you know, sort of shady illegal chop shop kind of thing. And then the other one was like, you know, kind of a drug dealer. And uh, I did all three of them and he kept me in there a long time. We had a good conversation. When I left there, I had every instinct that he was going to use me. Um, and he, he told the casting director, he said, yep, he, he's going to be in the film. Uh, and then we didn't hear anything for a couple of weeks. And then I started seeing it come out in Hollywood Reporter and stuff. You know, uh, one of the guys from Ballers, uh, the tall guy, Omar Brinson Miller, he got one of the roles auditioned for. And then Kevin Dunn from Veep, who's a much older guy than me, he got the detective. And then they went with like a, a scrawny, wiry kind of guy for like the meth dealer. And I was like, oh, shit. Well, I guess they were just going for three completely different types than me. And that's cool. It is what it is, you know. It doesn't hurt when, when you lose to, to somebody that doesn't look like you. Uh, and then we got a call, I guess, about they were I, they were about 20 days into filming. And my agent called me and said, uh, hey, remember when you auditioned for Bo Suspicion? I said, yeah, what's going on? He said, well, do you want to fuck Amelia Clark in a movie? And uh, I was like, um, OK, uh, I'm intrigued. Well, we're, we're, you know, because. I hadn't, I hadn't have the whole, I didn't have the whole script, you know what I'm saying? So, and they told me what the scene was and everything. And, uh, and it was written really, uh, I don't want to use the word vulgar, but it, it was written really, uh, really raunchy and uh, really clear on what, on what they were wanted to do. And, uh, <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, you know, let's, let's do it. You know, I'll, I'll figure out the details when I get there. And it was like just a couple of weeks before I moved to L.A. that that happened. And so, yeah, I drove down from Louisville to Harlan County because they filmed in Harlan County, the, the film, uh, where same place Justified was set. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I got there early one morning and uh, I met with Amelia pretty early on. Uh, and she was very kind, very sweet. And she informed me that she had watched my audition tape and told Philip that she would be comfortable working with me because you know, I was a real actor and not just some guy that sort of looked the part or fit the part. And so that made me feel good. And we just sort of, you know, I didn't bug her or ask her anything about Game of Thrones. We just two professionals talking and kicking it. And 
and she had uh, she had told me that um, you know that what we were going to do was going to be uh, a little bit more simulated than what it was in the script because she wasn't going to be doing nudity anymore. Uh, and which I understand. I was like, look, I said, I'm here to do a job. I said, if you're uncomfortable, I'm going to be uncomfortable and the audience is going to be uncomfortable. So you need to be comfortable and, and we'll figure it out. And um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's uh, definitely a challenge when you're butt naked with nothing but a cock sock <laughs> on. Uh, <laughs> walking across the sound stage with you know 80 people staring at you um but you know you gotta earn them stripes <laughs> so, uh, you know and we'll and we'll see what makes it what not i mean that that film has been done for a while uh the writer so you know it's based off of a new york times best-selling book and the writer of that book recently did a real in-depth interview and uh in the interview, I could feel his frustrations on why the film hasn't came out. Apparently, there has been a few screenings in like uh, the United Arab Emirates and like Abu Dhabi and places like that. Uh, a copy of it got leaked by a fan in Turkey last year. Um, and I've seen a couple different trailers and the trailers all seem to have a different tone to them. So, you know, I'm not here to, to play the guessing game and I'm not here to, you know, piss off any producers or directors and especially Philip working with Philip on that is how I got onto the resident. He liked working with me and offered me a spot on, on my first TV show. Uh, and I'm thankful for that. So I don't know what's going on. Um, it, it, I would think if people are, are wondering why the film still hasn't come out, I would just say Google uh, Above Suspicion and Google the writer and you can find an, a really in-depth article with the writer on what his thoughts are on why it hasn't came out yet. But as far as Amelia, she was awesome to work with. She was cool. She was sweet. In between takes, she'd sit there and like ask me like what my favorite Shakespeare roles were. And, you know, we were just like, you know, two professionals knowing that it was an awkward thing to do, trying to get through it. And uh, I hope to see her again someday. It'd be really great to be like, yo, remember me? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, That's awesome. I got another question. Can I ask uh, Daniel a question? If it's okay, I'm so sorry yeah, to like take yeah, the mic. Dude. Something I've been dying to ask him for forever too. Because <laughs> um, he's on this weight loss journey also, and he's been eating super healthy. And before the quarantine, he was like hitting the gym all the time. Um, I was curious like how that will affect um, – like you going up for auditions or will it change the parts that you go for or the, the, the way that people look at you from a casting perspective? Does that sure. change anything for you? Uh, I think, I think for now it won't because, you know, I'm a former college football player. I'm six foot two, 300 pounds. I got really massive shoulders as you can see. And these shoulders ain't going anywhere. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, my goal is to be the healthiest version of me possible I'm down 35 pounds since New Year's uh, New Year's Eve, yeah. and um, I, I, I'd be doing a lot better if the gym was still open, I'll tell you that much, uh, but I've been doing an hour of cardio every day, and uh, I'm kind of sick of doing pu push-ups and dips in my bedroom, to be honest with you, but, uh, you know, I, I had a friend of mine who tried to order those uh, interlockable Bowflex dumbbells and got scammed by one of those, like, things oh, that pop wow. up on Facebook, yeah, so... I've been trying to find resistant bands, but there's no place here open. And then you're, you know, you're wondering like, if I order them, am I going to get scammed? And you know, you don't want to be like out of eighty dollars. So I just been like, right now, I've been doing really low carb, um, pretty much only oatmeal in the morning with my eggs for carbs. Everything else, no carb, uh, because I'm only doing cardio and like push-ups and stuff. Um, but as far as my, you know, as far as like my look and everything. I don't think that metamorphosis would take place until like a couple of years down the line. And if it does put me into a different category, I'm, I'm ready for that challenge. You know, I feel like there's a lot of people out here who might look like me who don't have a master's degree in acting, who haven't had, you know, the training I've had and, and who did, you know, theater for 15 years. So more, more than anything, I, I don't want to be known as a type. I want to be known as an actor. And I've been fortunate enough, you know, just in the roles I've played in the last couple of years between, you know, like the drug dealer with the cornrows and Point Blank 
or like the the you know the cheetah ba- ba- yeah cheetah, cheetah. <laughs> yeah or like the you know the backwoods guy in Russ Creek or you know I played a firefighter in this film called Silo and so and, you know and then I just got done working with the Russo brothers and, and Tom Holland on a new film where I played a completely different role so so far I haven't been pigeonholed I've, I've been thankful for that um, but you know I, I look forward to the day where uh, I can just be seen as an actor. And, uh, but until then, you know, I'm just trying to be the healthiest version of me possible. And uh, if anything, I think at my current size and my current look, I think losing some, some belly and uh, firming up my chest will only add to the roles that I can play. Yeah. At least that's, at least oh, yeah. that's the way I'm going to keep looking at it. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Well, that's cool, man. Um, I want to ask Antonio, you just got announced, or was this recently or um, uh, probably a few months ago that you were announced one of the 20 most influ- influ- influential people in 2020? Is that right? Antonio, are you there? Did we lose him? We lost him. Oh, no. He's, He's stuck, stuck like you were the other day. He is stuck like me. He might need to log out and log back in. Nah, here, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me try to get him back. I was like, oh no, he didn't hear my question. <laughs> it looked like he's stuck by, by like, hmm? Indica right now. Hmm? Yeah. Hmm? He got the caps lock. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. I wonder why he's locked. Let me try. Let me. I, I, I have the I'm how I'm like hosting the meeting, so I have like options. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Give me a second. Uh, let me. Oh, I can put him in the waiting room. Let me put his ass in the waiting room real quick. Don't you ever put him in the waiting room, bro? Oh, he gone. He gone. Don't you I put just, baby in the corner? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody puts Antonio in the corner. <laughs> I just put Antonio in the waiting room, and uh. Hey. Let me see yeah, if it, tuck, tuck them put Antonio Pinto on timeout, bro. Yeah. Man, after just giving him a compliment, <laughs> I, I had a bunch of good stuff I was about to get into with him. Man, all right. Well, anyway, Will, you, why don't you text him real quick? And uh, oh, here he is. Here he is. Here he is. I got him. I got him. I got him. I got him. He's, He's back. back. He's back. Let's see if he comes back. It says joining. Boom. There he is. Where's Alex? Back in all the right. <laughs> Sorry about that. VA. I don't know what happened. You're still sideways. V8 oh. it. Turn your phone. There, well, there, there we it go. is. We got it. it. Now Sorry that you're back, that. We're it's back. all good. You I was all kinds of good shit. Yeah. You have to watch <laughs> it back. It's pretty funny. Um, so uh, I was just saying, um, I was asking you, and you froze up on me like a statue. You see, you just oh, man. Sorry. It was awesome. I was like, damn, he just, he's just like, he's just striking a pose for a minute before he answers me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, flexing them guns yeah for sure <laughs> so i was asking you you were named one of the 20 most influential people of 2020 recently right a couple months ago or so oh man yeah i was i was very lucky to be in there and probably shouldn't have been included but yeah thank you man <laughs> that's really cool and you and andy Bashir was in there too i i, I saw that he was also named which is funny because he's probably turned out to be one of the most influential people in America right now. Right yeah. Now, yeah. That's Andy funny. out there making panty draws wet, bro. They out oh, there calling him <laughs> Bay Shear. <Shira. laughs> uh, it's uh, true. Go- Govern me daddy is a teacher. Govern, <laughs> Govern me daddy. Yeah. But Antonio, I-, I-, I wanted to ask, so with this downtime, have you been, what have you been doing with that downtime as far as creatively? Uh, I know you were working. Um, on- unfortunately, nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I could, man. But um, but so uh, my wife has a temp job right now. So uh, so I'm just home with the kids at the moment. But um, so, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, she, we're just, you know, we're just doing the whole, uh, you know, she's, she's working and I'm just, I'm, I'm just home with the kids at all times. So it's tough to like check out and be creative. Daddy, unfortunately right now you cannot that's why i have to wait till my kids go to sleep before i can even think about doing this you guys know <laughs> yeah oh yeah 100%. He, he, he gotta he gotta be creative playing like the ground is made out of lava that's the creativity he's playing right, right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's exactly right so i wanted to ask you though like does <clears throat> so does this whole thing 
as everything we're going through with this coronavirus, does it halt your your plans for what's next as far as like, I know you had two projects you were working on um, the last time you were on. Has that changed or is, is there stuff on, on schedule to start, stuff like that? What's going Probably on? Probably on hold, most of it. Yeah, I think quite a bit of it's on hold, unfortunately, right now. But <clears throat> I have been working on like some other like pre-production stuff, like on the back end where um, I was reached out to by like a few people who produce some like some movies that I love. Um, it's kind of in my same genre and they wanted to help produce this film, um, which would be super, super cool. And then, uh, and then of That's course, cool. Sherman Brown, me and Sherman have been talking a lot about different things, but that was before the quarantine. Um, so it just, it's just a matter of man, like even to, to make a film and get it off the ground and have it cross the finish line is a miracle in the first place. So, you know, we've all got these ideas and these big ambitions and stuff like that. And it's so hard to bring them all to life, but, um, but yeah, man, I'm still dead set on doing these two films. Uh, hopefully still one this year but uh but if not then both next year i hope so so um but yeah it just it did it did put a little bit of a halt you know in the production timing of it and everything right. right so what what um can you just give us the names of those two projects if they have na- they do have names last time they did I don't yeah know. yeah one of them is called uh, the mortician and it's just basically about like a single mother who moonlights uh, as a mortician and then um and she has like a, a visitor uh, in her morgue, in her mortuary from, uh, from a prison who she thought was uh, still dead. And it turns out he's alive and he escapes prison and it turns into a home invasion flick. Uh, it's called The, the Mortician. And then, um, and then I have uh, another film on the radar that I'm working with, uh, Sonny Garrisomowicz from, uh, he did Where the Wild Things Are. And, mm. uh, and he, he created the monsters for that. So he's creating the monsters for this one. And he works with Henson Studios. And it's called Elena's Guardian, but it's about like a, an 11 year old disabled girl who lost her parents in a car accident, left her disabled. And then she wishes for a monster to come and exact revenge on her bullies. And it does. And it's got this massive, like if people have seen Labyrinth before with um, David Bowie and Jennifer Connelly, it has like a big Ludo kind of character. And, um, you just don't really know what's going on in the film, but it's a bunch of practical effects and uh, it's more kid friendly, but still pretty gory. And, you know, still, I think it's more true to my heart than other things I've done. That's cool. Very cool. Man. Yeah. If there's oh, anybody out there watching who ain't never seen Labyrinth, you need to get up on it because right. dance yeah. magic dance is where it's at. <laughs> if you ain't seen that bulge, then <laughs> <laughs> that lavender cod piece. <laughs> so while, while, while Antonio's out here eating way too much humble pie and getting ripped off of it I just want to go ahead and say I, I, when I, I did this film last year that just came out and Vincent uh, Guastini did uh, our special effects on it and Antonio worked with him and yeah. Vincent who's world renowned special effects uh, artist raved about Antonio and raved about uh, once, once, uh, what was it? Once is fallen, or uh, one must oh, fall. thank you. One, one must, fall, one must yeah. fall. Thank one you, must man. Fall. Thank you. Yeah, Vincent, he's, Vincent he's raved, awesome. He raved about you, man. And so, you know, we were on set out here in LA, and he was telling people, he's like, y'all need to watch this film, and y'all need to keep your eye out for this director. So, you know, you absolutely deserve to be on the the top twenty people to watch out for in Louisville. And oh, uh, bask in that, bask in that light, man. Step into that line, like let it shine on you. Absolutely, <laughs> man. Thank you, man. Big time. Everybody, That's so speaking, cool of you. I'm sorry, I mean to cut you off. Speaking of one must fall, though, didn't it just get added to Amazon? Yeah, we uh, we're on Amazon Prime now, and um, I think oh. it was last month they put it on Amazon Prime, and then we just um, we just signed with an international distribution company um, who is going to sell it to other territories, like. Uh, from an international perspective. So, um, and we did that. I signed with, a it's Hughes Pictures. I signed with them last uh, last month. So hopefully we'll be able to mean? people overseas. What um, does that mean you signed with them? For the movie or as a director? Yeah, so like uh, for the movie. So basically like um, we have our domestic deal with uh, Gravitas Pictures and they distributed the mu- movie domestically here like in all retail stores and all online and stuff like that. So they're working on our domestic deals. And then we have like an international sales agent who's going to distribute the film overseas because those people haven't really gotten a chance to see it outside of film festivals, which um, we did really, really well with the film overseas, like maybe even better than we did in the States. So I'm, I'm interested to see how the film performs 
um, overseas cool. from like a sales perspective now. I, I, I need to ask a question. So how many movies had you directed before this one? Is this the first movie that you've directed? Yeah, this is the first one. But um, you, you, you've you done other stuff like as far, I know you've done video, music videos and stuff like that, but you've directed like short films though, right? Yeah, yeah. We I did like a bunch of like short film and stuff like that. It's just stuff for fun mostly. Yeah. So what the question I have, like when I started off doing music, um, you know, I wanted for me the, the at the time, this is before independent music, what it what it is, what it is now. This is early 2000s when I had these dreams of signing that record deal. You know what I'm saying? Like making music, getting it noticed from you know, the people that can make big things happen for you as far as record labels and then actually getting in front of those people and getting in front of important executives and signing an actual record deal. To me, that was like unreachable and was like where I wanted to get because I thought when I got there that everything else was going to take off from there. And that's, first of all, that's not how the music business works, <laughs> you know, but I thought signing that record deal at the time as in my early twenties, I was like, Oh, I made it. We're, if I ever get to that point, we'll make it. You know, I thought that, but I would think a, lo with, a lot of actors think that too. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I would think with directing though, that um, a, a, a feeling of accomplishment for me would be being involved with getting my movie picked up uh, and recognized on like a national level. And when, when I say national level, I mean like the movie being for sale on iTunes. Um, Amazon uh, Prime. And being on Amazon Prime as part of their catalog. To me, I'd be like, well, shit, what I'm doing is obviously of quality or it wouldn't be on this level. So what I'm trying to say is, do you feel like are you amazed that your first film has made it to that point? Oh man, no, thank you though. But um, there's still like a lot of uh, trash on Amazon Prime too. So and mine's probably one of them. <laughs> so <laughs> so to that, yeah, but, compare it to the trash and stuff like that. Right? Yep. yep. <laughs> so maybe you know maybe mine's one of those. So um, so I don't know, man. Like uh, you know, doing the film festival circuit and stuff was super cool, and like the recognition and all that is really cool. But uh, but to keep it real, like. I love all that stuff and like that stuff is just an added bonus but I just really love the work like I just I just want to go back to do the work like I, what I'm really in love with is just doing the thing like creating um, yes. like everything that comes with it is just more for validation and stuff like that especially like um, if you're not like fully confident in the project or confident in yourself and stuff like that sometimes you do need that like um, that outsourced validation like that people say that you're worth it or the film's yeah. worth it but um, but for me like I um, I just really just want to do the work. Like I'm in love with that part of the process more than any of the other things so much that, uh, that the other things are great that come with it. Like when in the film festivals and stuff, um, sometimes I'd be like super surprised and I love to post about it and stuff like that. But, but I think once you start falling in love with the work um, and you like, you almost got to teach yourself or, you know, identify with yourself and realize like, what is it that you're actually in love with? You're if it's the end with, result. You're in love with the feeling of creating. Yeah. Right. I think, I think that's it. I think that's it. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was saying that's what it was for me. Like when I was creating music, it gave yeah. me a feeling that I loved and I knew to keep doing it, I would have to like progress with it if I really wanted to do it for like a living and stuff like that. So for me, I feel like, I feel like ultimately that's the business side of it is what kind of dampened or killed the passion for me on it. So I think it's dope to have that mind frame, like just strictly think about creating it and whatever happens, whatever spins off of it, spins off of it, you know? Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and I agree with you. So like, um, because I, I used to do photography for like a bunch of magazines and stuff like that here and other places and stuff. And um, once it started to become like a little bit too much about like uh, the work, like not enough about the work and the passion and started to become about money and stuff like that, I just checked out completely, man. Um, there was a magazine who had given me some, I don't know, some pushback on like what I was charging them, which wasn't even that much, you know, cause I just did it cause I loved it. Yeah. Um, once that started happening, I was just like, you know what? I just, I'm not passionate about it anymore. I quit photography for magazines and I just quit. I just didn't want to do it anymore because it stopped becoming about the passion. So I think once it stops 
being about that, then I'm just always ready to move on and check out. Yeah, man, for sure. Well, that's cool, man. Uh, um, I want to get a few more things in. We're, we're, we're at about an hour right now. We'll go about 15 more minutes, guys, just so you know, sure. in case you plan on anything. Uh, I want to ask um, – for uh, Daniel, I want to ask you what your upcoming, what what's the next thing that that could possibly come out? I know you don't always know because you just gave us a perfect example of one yeah. that never come out. Uh, but what do you know that's coming out next that people can look for you in? Uh, well, so uh, you know, I, the quarantine did a very interesting thing to me in the fact that uh, the the film that I had worked on with Vincent uh, and Thomas Jane. Um, it was due to come out uh, March 21st, I think it was. And we had our premiere set here in LA and all that got canceled. And uh, so our premiere got canceled and Lionsgate um, decided to, instead of waiting and putting it out, they decided to put it out digitally. So that movie came out on, on March 21st and, and it's out there. Um, it's called Hunter's Moon. It's a uh, straight up horror film, my first horror film I've done. Um, and so that came out and, and it was bittersweet. You know, I had a lot of the cast members texting me and saying like, yo, what's up with the premiere and this and that. And our director was actually in Croatia directing another film when all this happened. And he was flying back in the day before the premiere. And when all this happened, he had to take some crazy route of like, he had to go to like Moscow and then Moscow to Vancouver and Vancouver to LA to get back home. And then when he got home, he had to be quarantined for 14 days at an Airbnb away from his kids and his wife. So he was over, over in Europe during all this. So, you know, things like that put in perspective, like of course it would have been cool to be on the red carpet and <clears throat> seeing your people that you worked with before. Um, and a lot of, you know, a lot of people that you work with, uh, it doesn't always happen, but, you know, especially in, in this day and age with, with Instagram, you know, you end up developing these relationships and a bit of a, a, a friendship and kinship with people you work with and you start following each other and messaging each other. So it's always good when you get to a premiere because sometimes you haven't seen people in a year and it's, and it's a great time to celebrate, you know, like Antonio said, just finishing a film. Uh, and being able to, to get it out on, you know, whether it's Amazon Prime or whether it's Lionsgate or whether it's something, you know, huge in theaters, um, that in and of itself is, is a major challenge. So it's always, a, for me, a premiere is always a great time to see the people that I worked with for some, a lot of times the first time in a year and to sort of celebrate, you know, the hard work we, that we did. Um, so that, that came out on March 21st. It's on like all streaming platforms right now. Uh, I was in negotiations for two films. Uh, one was going to start April 15th today. <laughs> um, one was going to start April 15th and the other start at the end of April. And of course, um, you know, I'm still in the running for those. But the thing is, is that when casting and producers have more time to cast, they're going to keep looking. Um, so, you know, you try to lock down, try to get your agents and your people to lock down the contracts as soon as possible because you want to know that you have work, but sort of like pretty much negotiations for stuff like that have halted for right now because across the boards for everybody, because nobody knows when they're going to be filming. So, um, you know, I had interest from two different films, one of them really, really big. I, I can't talk about, uh, and then another one. Uh, was was still a really great opportunity um, and uh, so you know that's on hold for now uh, but uh, let's see um, come, uh, and then yeah the Russo brothers film uh, will be coming out supposedly in November but then again you know I, I don't know now when, when yeah. some of this can come out because I think a lot of a lot of places are going to be very strategic I think even if we did open back up on, say, June 30th, I don't know that a lot of companies are actually going to release content in July, August, and September. Because I think they're going to be, I think, I think they're going to be worried about one, are people going to have the money to go to the movies? And two, are people going to be, you know, 
wanted to go out to the movies and these spaces and are they gonna you know, trust I, right exactly I, I saw somebody joking about this the other day on facebook and it made me laugh but it, it, it may also made me go man that's a really good point they was like I'm a, once we all get released and we're back to normal, I'm gonna let y'all go test the air out for about 14 right. days. Y'all go out there, let get on y'all ski, and I'll, I'll, I'll sit back and wait and see how y'all do. See what and happens. I, yeah, and I think there's gonna be a lot of that. So I think it's gonna it's gonna be an interesting year as far as stuff being released. But one thing I can say, and I've been telling this to all my actor friends, is. It, right now, if you can weather the storm, if you've been smart with your money, and if you can weather the storm and use this time to either be creative or get your mind right, your fitness right, you know, whatever, whatever you can do to like, you know, utilize the time to the best of your advantage. If you can weather the storm, this, the drought season of the summer, that's usually no auditions, that's going to be the second half of pilot season. Yeah. So um, for the so for the first time in like probably thirty years, there's gonna be a lot of auditions in the summertime, and so I think there's gonna be a lot of productions more so than usual happening from August to December, and so and then a lot of that stuff that was planned for the fall will get pushed into the spring, and then that'll trickle into the summer of next year. So if people can weather the storm. It's <laughs> probably gonna make for a more year round supply of work for the next couple of years. Um, Cause so stuff will be pushed to the fall, some stuff in the fall will be pushed to the spring and that'll be pushed to next summer. So, you know, it's gonna be interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward though, for, for the, um, the Russo brothers film to come out. It was just such a, an honor to get that call to work with the directors of the highest grossing film of all time. Right. Um, and to work, you know, opposite Tom Holland and, uh, you know, the other great people in the cast from, from Bill Skarsgård to, um, you know, uh, Michael Gandolfini um, and, and really everybody. It was, it was really great experience. And, and those guys always put out great quality. And uh, it, it, I, honestly, when Tuck was asking the question earlier about movie theaters, it got me to thinking like, Probably what we're going to start seeing more of in movie theaters is those um, Avenger type films. I think you're going to start seeing more of your romantic comedies, more of your um, more of your stuff that doesn't involve spectacle. Probably won't go to the theater for a couple of years. Most of that stuff probably will go to streaming. Uh, I think people will start planning for that when they film things. Budgets for films that used to be thirty million will get cut to ten. The independent films that are ten million budget will get cut to like three, because people won't have to think in terms of, oh, well, we have to save this part of the budget for all this, you know, advertising we have to do for the theaters, because I think one one thing that is different is watching an Avengers movie or watching a Star Wars movie, it's different seeing that in a theater with the spectacle and the music and, and all of that. It's different watching that in a theater than it is at home. And I know there's a lot of people in our industry that have been complaining that those are the only types of films that have been coming out in theaters, which is not true, but it is the a majority. And I think, that, I think that's gonna be doubled down by our industry. Uh, I'll say this, I watched a film the other night that came out last year that I had not seen. And I'm mad at myself for not seeing it sooner. If you have not seen the peanut butter Falcon. I loved it. It was oh, phenomenal. so good, man. So good. One of well, the best films I've seen in 20 years. Yep. It was that good. And one of the more and one of the more unique films I've ever seen. Yeah, because you were you wanted to be a wrestler, right? So I mean, yeah, I, I was I was uh, I was going to go to college football and go into the professional wrestling business and I can started tell taking acting classes. <laughs> I love Shia, man. He's good. Yeah, good actor. Hey, I think like uh, one thing I was talking about, like on movies, there's people out there like me who like I think it's uh, in the future there's going to be to where you're going to be able to like pre-order like super early exclusive type movies to where. I'll pay 50 bucks right now to watch a movie that comes out in a month just to sit here at home and watch it. 
like a know, video game. Yeah, I don't give a fuck about going the way to people theater. pre-order Halo and shit. Yeah, and I'll stream yeah. it right now for $50. That's uh, People who have money will do shit like that. So I yeah, think yeah. there's a way to make money to balance it out to where there's going to be crazy people with money who will pay to stream it months in ahead and not even have to worry about a theater. Yeah. Ain't everybody, money, ain't everybody ever, balling with that Ford paycheck, though, player. But yeah. <laughs> hey, before, I forget, more. before I forget, you brought up something that uh, triggered a question that I that I forgot to write down for Antonio as far as when you, you may, and Daniel, you you probably have the same thing, but I feel like directing and, and, uh, and filming it is different when you, you, you have this thought in your brain, you write this movie, you film it, you direct it, you spend all this time editing it, and then you go to a movie theater and watch it. Like, what is that? Like? You know what I'm saying? Like, what is that feeling like as far as seeing everything you've been working on translated to a theater? I would feel... To me, it would be the equivalent of like playing my music um, through the best system in the world and hearing how it translates. You know what I mean? So, it, how was it seeing One Must Fall in a theater, like a real theater? Not like I think your first experience with it was pretty bad. You, I think. Yeah, you, um, we had um, we world premiered at a Horror Hound in um, in Cincinnati, yeah, which was awesome. We had like 400 people come out there from Louisville, which was super cool. And like, there's like 40,000 people that go there, which is insane. And it was like a bunch of celebrities, and like the the cast of the craft was there. Just it was really crazy. And then um, and then we wanted to do like a, a local premiere here in Louisville, um, so we did the Palace, and we had. I mean, it was like a thousand plus or something like that there, which was super cool. And it was a beautiful theater and beautiful experience. So it's just, it's, it's the greatest thing. Like, I mean, there's nothing else that can be compared to that. How did it translate to what I, to seeing it and hearing it and feeling it? Was it like surreal where you like, holy shit, like this is what, Yeah. not what you, you know, we already kind of covered what drives you to do it. But when you're seeing it in that setting, you're like, everything you'd been doing was kind of set up for that moment, you know, it seemed Yeah, it's insane. Yeah. I mean, cause like I, I wrote the film and directed it. So like, uh, <clears throat> you know, like when I, I wrote it, um, I knew somebody might think this is funny right here. Maybe one or two people will laugh, but like when you hear like 12, 1300 people in unison laughing at that moment or repeating it at, you know, in the lobby or something like that, uh, it's the greatest feel feeling in the world, man, you know, or like, uh, when I, I actually like put together a small video because I set up like two cameras when um, when we did the palace premiere and I had audience reactions and those are like authentic reactions that I can't pay somebody to do. So yeah. so um, yeah. watching all, I don't know if you guys had seen that, but watching all those authentic reactions where people were like covering their eyes or screaming or laughing or whatever uh, was just super, super cool, man. It was really beautiful and just really lucky. Like I said, it, it cannot be compared to anything else that I've ever experienced in my entire life. No, got, it's got to be a different experience for a director because as an actor at your premieres, you're sitting there going, God, I wonder what scenes they cut. Right. Because they always <laughs> cut something. They yeah. always cut something. I wonder you know, how they're going to make it a lot. Yeah, there, 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 was, there was a film that I was in with Mark Ruffalo. They just came out in January. I got cut out of it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, and, and here's the thing. They don't tell you. They don't no. tell you. No. You know, here I am trying to be a good guy and telling people, hey, it's out in theaters. Go see it. And then somebody goes to see like, bro, they cut you out. Ooh. <laughs> well, ain't no more free advertisement, then. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Fuck <Yeah>. that movie. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, I ain't gonna say, I, ain't, I, ain't, I mean, I'm not gonna hate against it, but I'm just saying, like, from an actor, they don't tell you. Ain't nobody emailing you, texting you, calling you, yeah. going, oh, by the way, yeah. you know, don't tell people to see this because we cut your scene. Yeah. You know, and it, it happens to the best of them. I mean, yeah. everybody, everybody from J.K. Simmons to, you know, all kinds of great actors always have stuff cut. And That's I learned a long time ago to just that is part of it. it is There's probably it is. fucking sons of actors that have been in movies that didn't, we never even know. They wasn't. Right. I have a couple actors. Of oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, Antonio. What were you going to say? No. I, I think just actors just have really, really, really tough skin, man. Because um, when I went through like the casting process for my movie, um, I just kind of put myself in their shoes. And I let I, we had over a thousand video auditions, but I literally emailed every single person back. Um, wow! And they were all very surprised. They were like, "Oh my god, I can't believe you emailed me back!" Like, <laughs> and I just kind of gave them feedback. But um, but I think that you know, like when they're taking on this role, they are they don't just like read it off a piece of paper. Usually, 
they they become the role and they feel like this role was meant for me and they took on the role because they felt like it was them so when they're giving it to you on video or through an audition they're thinking this is me i am this person you know and then like and then most of the times they don't ever hear back uh so like they're not getting told that you didn't get the role they're going to go on continuing to think that you know i am this person and like this is me and this was meant for me and i think you got to have some really really tough skin to be an actor to not hear back man like that the, 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 you know, and I know they can't email everybody back, but the casting director doesn't give feedback and doesn't say like, hey man, you were amazing. I'm gonna recommend you to other people or this was really great. You did this, or just some balanced feedback or something. But I feel like actors just have like this, this insanely tough skin that normal humans just don't possess. <laughs> <laughs> well, n number one, my friend, you are the exception to the rule. Right. And number two, you, you have to be, if you really want to be successful as an actor, you have to be because from the moment you walk in the room, you're being judged. Yeah. So, so especially when it's a face-to-face -face audition, you know, these days, as we've talked about on other podcasts, a lot of it is what they call self-tape where you tape the audition and send it in. But when you get to those further levels and you get into director sessions or producer sessions and it's down to you and one other person or you and two other people, the moment you show up to the building and walk in the building, everybody in that building is judging you. How hard are you sweating? What did you wear? You know, how clean are your shoes? You know, how dry is your beard? <laughs> it's like they just constantly judging you up and down and it's just part of the process. It, it, it becomes breathing air. It's like, it's what you do. Auditioning is what you do as part of your daily life, which is like breathing air. I have two requests for you guys. Um, one, that you two work together in the future, which I oh, we, we, but that's a, I think that's a mutual feeling that we both want to make that happen. Hey, I'd and, be honored, man. And, and Daniel, you, you can vouch for my movie idea. It's hey, our I, <laughs> I told you, man. I, I, I sat there and, and, and I tagged him and Sherman on Facebook. And I was like, yeah. yo, I was talking to Tuck. Arcadia or whatever. I don't know what you're talking, calling it, but I don't know yet. We had yeah. a whole podcast <laughs> with the whole movie idea. But oh, y'all did? Um no, me, you and him. Oh yeah, yeah we really did. <laughs> From the time you were over here, I used some of that shit we talked about. But here's what Good. I'm saying. I just want y'all to read it. Read that it, it's not a script. It's a, a um, I guess, is what you guys call a treatment or a story. Yeah. It's a, just a story. Look, I'm going to be mad if you don't send it to me. I can't write a script. I'm not even going to pretend that I can because I tried and the shit was garbage. <laughs> what I can do is write a story. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I just want you guys to read it. And Antonio, I want you to take a good, hard look at it. And just it, even if one percent of you just gives me one little bit of consideration to read it, like I don't know if it's good, maybe I will make the movie or write. Yeah, the story. I would love to see it. I'd be honored, man, and for if sure. It's trash, it's trash. And just you if know, you're like, ever gonna send it, a quarantine is the time to hold us accountable, <laughs> right? So it ain't, they send it, to do, bro. I, I need another year. I need another. Year. <laughs> you don't need another year for a treatment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm joking. That's too but, critical of it. The, my 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 first request was though that you guys work together. That would be awesome. It would be even cooler if it just so happened I wrote a story that you guys both ended up <laughs> working on together. But that's hey, that's smoke dreams. And, and second, uh, uh, Antonio, on your next movies, um, especially if you do like a really like super horror film, kind of like the last one you did. Um, but even on these next movies, just just leave the, the door open for me to send over some music. Yeah, for sure. I would love that. I'd be honored, man, for sure. It's not like uh, we'll talk about what the movie's actually about, scenes you have in mind, music you actually need, because that's the type of stuff that would motivate me to really make some dope music just specifically for something. So yes. just leave the door open for me. I'll send an email over. And you, I, I mean, I'll send you an MP3 over and you can use it or not. And just let me know if you do. Dude, so, that'd be awesome, man. Yeah, dude, that'd be incredible. Yeah, so I would love to do that. And I know some people have actually used uh, Vilbilly's music in movies, but I can I can make, like, specialized shit. You know what I'm saying? There's my pitch. There's my pitch. Uh, and, man, that's all that i got. We've been on for an hour and 22 minutes now. Will, is there any quick thing you want to hit? No, man, that was cool. I liked it.
Uh, anything you guys want to add before we sign off, John? Anything you want to say? No, nah, man. Awesome, uh, awesome time. Appreciate everybody tuning in and uh, being here, man. This was great. So nice to meet you, man. Cool to talk about shit other than just Corona dealing with our lives is uh, seeing what it affects like people out in LA and in the music biz and, and the, I mean the movie biz and shit. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the only thing I gotta say in closing is. Everybody who's watching or anybody who does watch this, make sure you go to Amazon Prime and watch uh, One Must Fall, uh, Antonio oh, Centaur's <laughs> film. And uh, and if you haven't seen season three of Ozark yet, go watch Tom Pelfrey as Uncle Ben because he's going to win every supporting actor award. He's this good, year. dude. And if he don't, there's a problem. Wait a minute, <laughs> Uncle Ben, I've been watching. Oh, yeah. He's oh, yeah. He's great. I'm yeah. about four episodes in. Oh, oh, you you in strap in, player. You in He's for a ride. <laughs> yeah. Man, thank you, Daniel, big time. Uh, I just got one thing. Uh, my, my buddy Dusty just dropped his album, Kentucky Anna Jones, and uh, he's amazing. He's he's just the greatest guy in the world, and uh, you guys all know him. Dusty. But um, but he just dropped it. Yeah, yeah, Dusty Lee, and uh, and I think that uh, it, if you guys could check it out, it's it's just an amazing album it's called Kentucky Anna Jones. For sure. Yeah. Very cool, man. And uh, thank you guys as always. This It's funny, we got both of you on, so now neither one of you have the record. You're tied. I know. Tied We're the again. four horsemen. The four tied. horsemen of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, they're tied. Our first, so. This is our first Zoom, too. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. so this worked out pretty cool, man. And yeah. I promise you, I'm extending both of this, this to both of you guys. If you see us on one of these YouTube lives and you happen to catch it, send me oh. a message. And ask for the link, and I'll patch your ass in. I swear, to God, I'll put you right in here, and you can you can come in and join us while this is going on. Especially, you know, we just need some entertainment out here. Um, sure. But anyway, thank you, man. Thank everybody for watching. At one point, we had a ton of people watching, so that was yeah. cool. Everybody, uh, be safe. Yep, yeah, this will be up on YouTube from now and until the internet disintegrates into nothing. So yeah. <laughs> you'll be able to find it on uh, Speaking Easy podcast on youtube no g in the word speaking uh you can find us on all social media and man it's been really cool antonio thank you daniel thank you john thank you and will uh, hey put that battery on your porch in the morning and I'll help, you, you. Bro. help me help me, me. all right all right hey, thank you guys hey, have be safe peace